Hello, this is the sixth module in a video series about using the concepts from the Baldrige Improvement Model for department and unit improvement. This module is all about how you do what you do, your operations. Now, I'm not talking about the cheesy 1980s board game operation. And by the way, where is the spare rib located in the body? Rather, this is all about how you design, manage, improve, and innovate around your educational programs, services, and processes, such as research, engagement, and teaching. Another important topic in this module is emergency management, how your unit prepares for continuing its operations in the face of an emergency. To get started, the first thing units need to do is to identify their key work processes and the requirements those processes are designed to meet. It's important to start here because you cannot manage, improve, or innovate around your key processes until you know what they are. Key work processes are your unit's most important internal value creation processes. This is not a list of everything you do. Notice the word key here. Rather, it's those things that are essential to your success. So for example, if your unit makes ice cream, a key work process would be the packaging of the ice cream into suitable containers. Now, not being in the manufacturing industry, we have to think a little bit differently about our key work processes. So some examples might be in the area of teaching, key work processes might include curriculum development, enrolling students in programs of study, enrolling students in courses, advising to support students progress in their programs, assigning clinical placements, certifying learning through the assignment of grades, awarding degrees and certificates to acknowledge students learning and success. And of course, these work processes are not valuable unless they're designed to meet some kind of important student requirement for students or other customers. So for example, students have the need to know what courses to take, in which semester, in what order, and how the transfer credits apply to meeting their program of study. Now, our advising work process, for example, is designed to meet those requirements from students by giving them the information and support they need to take the correct courses in the correct order to graduate on time. Now, knowing the needs of students and other customers was discussed in Module 3, so if you would like, you can view that module to learn more about that topic. The third thing to consider in your key work processes is how you assess the effectiveness of your key processes in meeting the key requirements. So to return to the ice cream example here, we certainly would want to know how much of the ice cream we, pr we produce is packaged correctly, how many packages fail before they leave the store, how many fall apart when they're on the store shelves, and what customers think about how easy the packages are to open and use. So essentially, we want to know if your packaging process is meeting the requirements of our customers. So bringing these three things together, your unit needs to think through what are your key work processes, what requirements are they designed to meet, and how do they measure performance of those processes in meeting those requirements. Now, if you get this completed, you can also move on to support processes and also examine day-to-day -day operations. Now, another important operational area to consider is your suppliers. So for many units, an important component is the level of success that they have with working with their suppliers. So the first thing I think about when I hear the word supplier is a stapler. I'm not sure why that word comes to mind. I suppose it's the assumption that suppliers are external to my unit and provide consumable materials like paper, staples, office chairs, and so on that are required for the success of my unit. And certainly that's one type of supplier that's important, although I can't actually think of the last time I actually stapled something together. But external suppliers also might include things like software vendors, or you might even consider K-12 schools as suppliers in that they provide students who enter the university. Or another example might be even general education courses that are offered in other colleges that prepare students with certain knowledge and skills that are required for sex, success and programs in your unit. Suppliers might also be internal. So consider, for example, instructors that have courses in a sequence in the same degree program. In this way, uh, an instructor in an, a, a course early in the program might be considered a, su a supplier for the instructor in the later course by ensuring that the students are prepared for the later course because they're handing off the students from one course to the next. So as you think about suppliers for your unit, a good first step is to simply list them out. Who are they? What do they supply? And are they external or internal? Once you have your list of suppliers, you can consider these more challenging questions. How are suppliers selected? In some instances, you may not have any say in who is selected as a supplier. But in other instances, you might be able to have all the choice in who your supplier is, and you might, as a unit, choose from a long list of suppliers. And once you choose a supplier and you're working with suppliers, how do you track their performance and how do you provide them with feedback on their performance? And what do you do if they're not meeting your expectations? So for example, if your grant submission software crashes, 
on the due date of every major grant submission. What would you take? What actions would you take to get them to address this issue or allow your unit to move on to another supplier? Two additional topics to think about that the pandemic really highlighted was supplier agility and resi resilience. So what happens if you have to make a major change in your operations in a short amount of time? Or if there's some issue with your supplier's supply chain, would you be able to keep your operations going if they had challenges with their, their supply? So now that we've thought about work processes, key requirements and suppliers, we're going to talk a little bit about innovation in work processes. Now, innovation can sometimes be intimidating. When we hear the word innovation, we sometimes think of major disruptive changes like the first iPhone or the creation of the first light bulb. And innovation certainly can look like that. But innovation can also be something more simple, such as adjusting the way you schedule advising appointments to better meet students' needs or something very basic about the way you promote your unit. So innovation is really just any meaningful change that's implemented to improve programs, services, processes in a way that creates new value for those you serve. Another thing to remember is that innovations are not accidental. So consider again this example of the light bulb. We often think of the invention of the light bulb as the quintessential aha moment. But while there were aha moments along the way, the development of the light bulb took decades of work from companies and individuals all around the world. An effective light bulb was not something that someone merely stumbled upon one day. There was a persistent, ongoing, concerted effort over many, many years to create an effective light bulb and lots of missteps and trial and errors along the way. And if you think about this, uh, today there's still continued development of advanced LED bulbs, for example, that save electricity and produce much less heat. So there's still innovation going on in the light bulb industry. So recognize that innovation isn't accidental. There's four components to think about in your unit regarding innovation. So first, how does your unit identify opportunities for an innovation? If we think about innovations as nothing more than improvements in what your unit does, how do you identify those areas where improvement might be needed or areas where you might target your innovation efforts? And once those opportunities are identified, how do you pursue those opportunities? Are there resources set aside for these activities? And how do you decide to discontinue pursuing these opportunities if the innovation effort isn't panning out? And how do you decide to end a program or service that's not effective? And finally, how do you communicate and implement innovations once the, there's a decision to move forward? So identifying opportunities for innovation starts with measuring performance. If you don't know the areas in which you might improve, you can't identify priorities for innovation efforts. Other sources of information about opportunities for innovation might include advisory boards who might recognize trends and changes in the external environment, or open feedback meetings with students, customers, and members of the workforce and other stakeholders. So once opportunities for innovation are identified, you need a strategy for pursuing those opportunities. Now, if you ask most employees if they have time to take on another project, I think most of them will tell you no, they're already maxed out. So that's why it's important to frame innovation not as an add-on or additional work that gets done on the side when you have time, but rather it should be something that we're expected to do as a core part of our jobs. A recent Baldridge winning organization in Iowa described their employees as having two jobs. One, doing their work, and two, improving their work. So in this way, innovation is expected to be a part of everyone's job all the time. It's not an add-on or a separate project or a side thing that they do just when they have a few minutes of extra time. So with that perspective in mind, innovations still do take time and resources. So some strategies some units have used to support innovations include offering micro-grants or startup funds to get innovative projects off the ground. Some units have also hired flexible employees like graduate students to help support the implementation of innovative projects. Another way to allow space for innovations is to start innovations on a small scale with a pilot project and then to learn from that pilot project and prepare to scale it up once it's been shown to be successful. Now, one advantage of starting innovation as a pilot project is that it can be discontinued if it doesn't pan out the way it had been expected to pan out. So more broadly, knowing when to stop doing something is also important for innovation and for the health of your unit. Continue to invest in a program or a service that's not tied to your mission, vision, and values, or that's not effective, limits your ability to pursue innovations and support success for the other components of your unit. Now, of course, it can be very difficult to discontinue successful programs and services in this situation, but it's important to recognize that your running of programs and services that are not part of your mission and vision take away from your ability to pursue those things that are, are central to your mission. And finally, innovations need to be communicated and fully implemented. So consider, for example, if you had a bunch of people doing the same job, say typing acceptance letters on a standard typewriter, 
Uh, but then one of your employees discovered a mimeograph machine, which could crank out the acceptance letters in a fraction of the time, while also giving them a much-needed arm workout. Now, as an aside here, I'm young enough where I never learned typewriters in school, but I am old enough where many of my elementary school mornings were started with the, the sound of the ka-chunk, 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 ka-chunk mimeograph machine from the teacher's workroom. So the point is here that your unit needs to have a process in place for communicating innovations and supporting implementation of the innovation across the unit for full effectiveness. Now the last component of this module is emergency preparedness. Emergency preparedness has two major parts. The first part is how you provide a safe operating environment and proactively seek to prevent emergencies. So for example, a fire would be a major emergency and would present numerous operational challenges for your unit. The picture shown here is from a fire on the University of Iowa campus in mid-2020 in the communications building. Now fortunately there were no injuries in the, as the building was in the process of being demolished, but it highlights the first step in emergency preparedness, which is to seek to prevent them. This might include activities like using fire-resistant materials and renovations, training staff and students on the proper use and storage of dangerous chemicals and substances, and ensuring employees do not experience dangerous work environments. The second part then is to take steps to be able to respond for those emergencies that cannot be prevented. This might include emergencies like fires, floods, pandemics, cybersecurity events, derechos, tornadoes, earthquakes, power outages, locusts, and so on. So your unit should develop a plan to respond in the event of emergencies, regularly update that plan, and test it with support from the University of Iowa's Emergency Preparedness Office. So that is all for Module 6, your processes for designing, managing, improving, innovating, and protecting your operations are important for the success of your unit. There's four activities shown here with this module that will help your unit think through these important issues. Thank you for watching.